It's a mailbag episode. We got questions about Yusuf Nurkic, Norman Powell, and Serial. Welcome to Lockdown Blazers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Trailblazers, your daily Portland Trailblazers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, world? It's your past first point guard and Trail Blazers reporter, Mike Richmond. You're listening to another episode of Locked on Blazers, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, available wherever you get podcasts and now also available on YouTube. If you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel and you're listening to my voice, do me a favor. Either if you're watching on YouTube, just smash that subscribe button. It's right there waiting for you. Or if you're listening in a podcast feed or if you're, if you're a podcast listener and you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel yet, go ahead and just go to YouTube, search Lockdown Blazers and subscribe to the show. Help us grow our community there. It would, uh, would mean a lot to me and I'd appreciate it. Today's episode is a, is a mailbag episode, special delivery mailbag. I was going to call it Mailbag Monday, but we're not recording on Monday. We're recording on Tuesday nights. Uh, we do this each week, answering listeners submitted questions all episode long. Typically, I record on Mondays and post it on Tuesdays, hence Mailbag Monday. But when games or news get in the way, we push it back later in the week. We do not miss mailbags here. We love them. We do them each week. They're a ton of fun. So if you want to get involved in one of these in the future, if you're a new listener or just someone who hasn't asked a question before, there's two ways to do it. You can tweet at me at Mike G. Rich on Twitter. That's Mike G. Rich. And you can find this in the episode description for this episode as well, the directions on how to do this. But Mike G. Rich on Twitter, just send me a tweet whenever you're thinking of it. Helps if you tag it in some form or fashion as Mailbag Monday. Um, or if... Uh, or on the day of the show, I will send out a tweet. If you're following me on there, you'll see the tweet. You respond to that, um, and I will do my best to get you in a show or a future show. I save questions. I kind of just, um, you know, I if they're relevant, I keep them. If they're fun and kind of evergreen, I'll keep them and uh, and answer them later. So, uh, so yeah, respond to that tweet. I'll do my best to get you in the show. If you're not a Twitter user or just someone who doesn't tweet, you can just email me, lockedonblazerspod at gmail.com is the address. That's lockedonblazerspod at gmail.com. Like I said, we do this every week. It's a ton of fun. So let's just do it. Neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night stays mailbag from your ears. Our first question comes from Lil Ucho at Lil underscore Ucho on Twitter who asks, what does Yusuf Nurkic, Nurk, need to do to return to Nurk fever levels? A lot of questions about Nurk this week. Um, I kind of think Nurk is an unfair scapegoat, but let's let's go through these a little bit, and I'll kind of unpack what I mean by he's 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 a, it's like an undeserving scapegoat for the Blazers' struggles. Um, what does Nurk need to do to get back to Nurk fever levels? He just needs to be a little more consistent on offense. Um, you know, he was he was just a he was a more consistently impactful player at his at his peak as an offensive player. Some of that was uh, style. He was getting more post up touches back way back when in 2017 um the the offense was a little bit different so it was just like a ton of pick and roll um and he was he was he was just an he was really good at at um operating with dame he was really good at um he was a little bit better at just sort of um using using his power and also it was just like he was on a heater for a month um you know guys get hot it's it's the way the sport works um you know it didn't it, it's not like <laughs> It's not like it ended with a title run, right? Like um, it, it kind of fizzled out quickly in the end there. But at his peak, he was just a more consistent offensive player. Uh, he's been really good on defense this year. Uh, it, that doesn't necessarily, and I, I said this last week in the mailbag, is that I, when I watch Nurk, I don't think like, man, he's kicking ass on defense. But um, he's second in defensive rating according to 538's Raptor defensive metrics. Um, I'm not a big fan of... Uh, of like catch all defensive stats. I don't think any of them do a great job, but like he, they, they definitely point you in a certain direction. And if Nurk is second overall, the only one ahead of him in, in that metric is, is Rudy Gobert. Who's like one of the great defensive players in the history of the sport. Um, you, you know, Nurk's pretty good. According to clean the glass, uh, the Ben Falk's wonderful, indispensable stat site, uh, Nurk is incredibly impactful, um, as, as a defensive player, one of the, one of the more impactful defensive bigs in the league. Like, if it doesn't match the eye test, but all of the advanced numbers are, are, are pointing you in that direction. And I don't think def, uh, defensive rating is an individual stat. So do not send me individual defensive rating. I, that does not account for teammates or whatever. These other stats do a better job of counting who you, who, who you share the court with. Like if all the stats say Nurk's been really good on defense, 
I got to trust that like he's at least been better than my eyeballs. Uh, the numbers help us learn more about the game. They do not tell us the ultimate truth. But if all of the numbers say the same thing, I'm someone who really believes that the stats can help us be smarter about what we're watching. Um, even if they totally, if, if, if they're, if they're sort of like relatively in line with what we're seeing, I don't see Nurk as, as having an elite defensive season, but the numbers say he's been really darn good. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to trust him. So the defense isn't the problem. The way Nurk gets back to Nurk levels is being more consistent offensively. He's just not getting shots in the offense. And that's a problem with um, the teammates, you know, sharing the floor with him, not getting him into the offense. It's the problem with um, maybe not running enough stuff for him. I don't want to see Nurk post up more. Uh, that's not, that is not a solution for me. I'm sure he wants more touches on the block. Um, he just they need they need to figure out how to get him more involved as a pick and roll player it's where he's been his best made his best offensive impact so like him as a roller needs nurk as a roller needs to be a little bit better that's on him that's on the coaching staff and that's on his teammates that's and if he was a, if he was a more consistently impactful offensive player this year i think we'd be singing his praises because he's been really good on defense and if you dig even a little bit into the numbers you start to say oh Maybe Nurk's been awesome and I haven't been paying attention. Um, that doesn't mean he's going to play well every single night. It's consistency. It doesn't mean that he deserved to close the game against the Raptors because that was a bad matchup for him. But um, Nurk's been, I think Nurk's been better than people think. In fact, um, Alex Hernandez at ALX8 underscore HDZ00, that's Alex Hudiz00 on Twitter, uh, asks, do you think Nurkic is going to start seeing a bench roll, and do you think he will accept that or completely give up on the team? Uh, I do worry that if he did get benched, he might check out. I do I do think that that is a reasonable concern, but no, I don't think he's going to get benched. I think if there's a change in the starting lineup, it's going to be Robert Covington. Um, I, I say that based on Covington... <laughs> Um, struggling a little bit with certainly less consistent uh, than he's been. His, sh his shooting numbers are really good this year. St I, think, I think he's above 40%, but um, his just decision-making has been bad, and he has been a, a bad half-court player other than the nights the shot go shots goes in. Shots go in, and he's been, uh, you know, he, he five threes and basically won the game against the Pacers. There's been nights where he's been indispensable, and I thought he played okay against the Raptors on Monday night too. Like I thought that was a pretty good uh, Rocco game, but he's he's the he's the one you can you change out. Um, and I say that based on reporting from Jason Quick of the Athletic, friend of the show, who's going to join the program later this week, and just kind of. Um, my eyeballs suggest that Rocco is the weak link right now in the starting lineup and an easier one to change uh, because you can, you have Nas and you have Larry Nance, like you have better options. So I think Rocco is going to be the guy who changes, not Nurk. Uh, but I do worry that if Nurk did get benched or if Nurk continues to sit in the fourth quarters, um, there could be some issues with him kind of checking out with him being frustrated because he's been, um, you know, even without like translating Instagram comments from Bosnian, uh, you, he's been a little bit cryptic on social media with his frustrations. And uh, I thought there was a moment in the game against the Raptors when he kind of sarcastically celebrated a bucket where to me, my read was like, oh, I finally got the ball and I scored. Look at me. Like there's some, there's some frustration certainly brewing with his offense role I think that's um I think you know he, he, he might not admit that publicly but from my vantage point I think that that's obvious also he's just he's just getting way less offensive chances of course like everyone wants the ball more and wants to score it's how the league works um Jason Reyes at Jason underscore Reyes underscore don't forget that second underscore asks have we already seen Nurk's best in a blazer uniform do you think he will ever surpass how good he was pre-injuries I don't know. And this makes me, this bums me out. I was talking about this um, with my uh, wife today. We were talking out. She said, you know, what's, what's in the mailbag? She's curious. Um, uh, an occasional listener and a big Blazer fan. And, and I said, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of people are, are asking about Nurk. And we started talking about sort of pre-injury Nurk and how special that run was in 2019 and how he just doesn't look like that. The explosiveness, you know, the, the ability to just kind of, um, to occasionally overpower people inside. Like he still does it from time to time. You certainly see it, but he's, he was always a little ground bound and he's even more. So you just, he just doesn't have the burst that he once did. And it stinks because like injuries are part of the sport, but also it's just like a bummer when people's bodies fail them. It's, I hate it. I hate it for Nurk. I hate it for Nurk that at the peak of his powers that he had a, a like a freak injury and broke his leg. I hate it for him because he was awesome awesome during that 2019 run and he hasn't gotten back there even in the bubble where he was really good for those eight games he wasn't that good um he played his, his tail off but he wasn't that good um you know so i guess like the sad answer to your question jason underscore reyes underscore is 
probably not because like um aging is hell but like I don't think he's I don't think he's super duper far away on the defensive end. It's really about where he can get to on consistently get to on offense. Um, and if he can, you know, if he can, his decision making tightens up in terms of when to make what kind of pass. If if he if he catches passes on the roll and makes smarter decisions as a roller, um, I think he can. I think there are simple and reasonable steps for him to be better on the offensive end. And a, a lot of what we're seeing is probably a really good defensive season from Nurk. So it's really about um, consistency on offense and and not turning the ball over and and just, um, you know, playing his tail off like he did against the, the Raptors where he did not have a good offensive game, but he played really, really hard. Next question comes from B-Ball at Pam Sears, Pam Sears on Twitter who asks, when Neil Olshay is fired, do you see whoever we hire as new GM being aggressive off the bat or waiting a while and seeing how things play out? Um, this might be a false premise. I thought Neil was going to be fired last week. Every minute he is still on the job makes it more likely he will not be fired. This, I'm just logicking this out. I'm not reporting this. Um, he's, when Chris McGowan left, it signaled that the whole enterprise is kind of messy on the inside and i'm sure we'll hear more about that mess sometime in the nearish future but neil didn't get fired and then the weekend passed and then monday happened and then tuesday and off day happened and every minute he's still every minute the investigation is ongoing and not concluded is a minute where neil will quote unquote beat it or just survive it and and maintain his position he's not going to resign and give the money back he would have already you know he would have already struck a deal and done, and did that and jason quick of the athletic reported quick reported that um that's you know a deal is not forthcoming and if the blazers don't want to fire him and pay him out his contract I think he's going to, to stubbornly stay on the job. Um, I, I'm telling you, every minute, like I'm recording this at after 10.30 p.m. on uh, Tuesday, November 16th, and you're hearing this probably sometime November 17th or a little bit later, like every minute he's not fired is makes it more and more likely he, he won't, he will retain his, his spot. I just, I, I think you, I think you, um, I think you, dear listeners, need to start bracing for that reality. I did not think, you know, if you'd asked me at this time last week, no, no way. Um, but th the, the lack of action, you just have to, you use your brain. Um, it, it would have happened or, you know, um, the, f like, if if there if it was there if this was there and that fireable fence was there the fact finding thing wouldn't have had to conclude for two weeks it wouldn't be a deep long run it would have been four or five days get some interviews corroborate the facts find what you find and move on um it's uh you don't need two weeks or however long it's going to end up being to figure this out so every minute that neil is still on the job makes it more likely he will maintain this job and chris mcgowan stepping down although mcgowan insists that it was unrelated to me reads as a related thing that suggests that maybe neil will maybe neil safe maybe he'll maybe he'll maybe he'll stay stay employed and stay in the role so um when when it happens should neil be fired we'll talk about sort of what's next and the implications and trades and blah 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 but like i think we got to just face reality that that change maybe ain't coming the change is is change is gonna come sometime down the line uh all right let's come back in the second segment answer more of your questions on this glorious mailbag monday we got we got fun ones about ben mclemore dennis smith jr and norman powell but first let's talk about calm when it comes to athletes we tend to focus on physical fitness but there's another side to the game that's just as important it's mental fist if mental fitness and calm the number one app for sleep and meditation has teamed up with nba star lebron james to help you train your mind to become the champion version of yourself lebron and calm know your mind is like any other muscle in your body but you don't have to be a world champion to learn how to train it Calm can help you train your brain to s so you sleep better, reduce stress, and perform at your best. Listen, sleep is critical to anyone's mental fitness routine. You sleep better, you, 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 you get good positive rest, you're going to feel better the next day. 
And that mental fitness, that mental rest is going to lead to better f physical fitness. So if this sounds like something you're interested, why don't you go to calm.com, right? Calm.com slash locked on MBA right now. And for a limited time, you'll get 40% off a calm premium subscription with calm. You've got access to nature scenes like rain on leaves and so much more like sleep stories and meditations. So you can be ready for any challenges that life throws your way again for a limited time. My listeners can join, uh, can join the, the meditation and, and mental fitness world using Calm and get 40% discount on a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash locked on MBA. Unlock content to help you focus, ease stress, and sleep better. Get started at calm.com slash locked on MBA. That's calm.com slash locked on NBA. Today's show is also brought to you by Bill Bar. It's just the best tasting protein bar that there is. Uh, they're not pulling any fast ones on you. They're just making delicious bars. Um, I have been telling you about Built Bars in this space for a long time. I've also been eating them in my home for a long time. I, I literally ate a built like coconut Built Bar today, Tuesday evening. I was going to play some pickup basketball. I knew uh, that it, it was happening in the evening time and I was going to miss a sort of typical dinner. So I reached for something that would boost my blood sugar and pack a punch. It's delicious and nutritious. 17 grams of protein in that coconut bar, 130 calories, only five grams of sugar, and, and only four grams of net carbs. It fueled me to go play basketball. Now, my team did lose the pickup game, and then we lost the second game too. But that wasn't Bill Barr's fault. That was because your boy was shooting bricks. Uh, but listen, I was able to play two and a half hours and had the fuel I needed. And, and while I was eating it on the go, it tasted great too. So why don't you go fuel up and maybe your jumper will be a little more, a little more pure than mine. That's go to built.com and use the promo code locked 15. You get 15% off your order. That's locked 15 for 15% off at built.com. All right. Let's keep it rolling on this glorious mailbag Monday. We talked a lot of Nurk and a little bit of Neil in the first segment. Let's let's switch it up. This next one comes from Lovebug Starsky, who asks, I lost your question. Lo Lovebug Starsky, who asks, do you think Ben McLemore should see some run over Tony Snell? Or is Snell out there for his length and his defense over McLemore? I believe Ben is a shooter, is a better shooter than Snell, can do, do some of the same things. No? Nope. It's a size thing. Um, the Blazers just don't need more shooting guards. Ben McLemore, like they have too many shooting guards as is. Um, it, it's it it just they need size. And I, I quite frankly, I think Tony Snell's minutes have been pretty positive. Um, I know that he doesn't do much. <laughs> like I recognize that. Um, in fact, the game against uh, the game against the Raptors was a truly bizarre Snell game. Missed his only shot, a three. Had three assists and a steal, and played 11 minutes when it was plus 11. He was on the court during the 10-0 run to open the, the fourth quarter, or the eight eight of the I believe 10 points uh, to open the fourth quarter. And um, so that's going to help your plus minus when your teammates make shots. But like. I think typically I've liked Snell's minutes. I like his length. Um, I think he has slow feet, but I think the length helps. I kind of, I, I like Snell and just like specifically Macklemore. There just isn't room for another. They just don't have room for another guard. They'll be playing small every single minute of the game with Macklemore. I'll tell you this, Ben Macklemore is an NBA player and could be more helpful on another NBA team. I've talked about this too with some friends watching the game. It's like, you see him in at crunch time. He's like, he's just clearly uh, an NBA contributor. He can shoot. He's um, he's got a little bit of juice athletically still. Um, he's a really good athlete. We came out of uh, came out of Kansas, but that was you know 2013. Um, but he's like he could help. He just like he doesn't fit this team because they have too many guards. Maybe after they make a trade, you'll see Macklemore be part of um, part of the rotation because they like I think he's an NBA contributor. He just does not. Um, he doesn't. Fit he, he almost never checks a box for kind of like, what what else do we need with this lineup? In fact, you were the only one to kind of question uh, the Snell inclusion. Ambient Marmalade, at Ambient Marmalade on Twitter asked a similar question, but instead of Ben McLemore said, uh, Dennis Smith Jr., like get him in the game, get get some get more playmaking in the game. And I, same deal, like Dennis Smith Jr. is probably an NBA player and could probably be like a, a decent backup uh, point guard on a lot of teams. Like, I think he can play. I think he's, he's um, a pretty good, he's been a better defensive player than I think um, I thought he would be. And when he's been in the game, I think generally he set people up and kind of like been a played point guard, but been a pass first point guard, you may recall. Um, but like, he's 
on this team, they don't, they just don't need more guards. They don't need to put more guards out there. They need to figure out a way to have less guards out there would be ideal. Um, but like if, if you have Dame and you have CJ and you have Norm playing a bunch of minutes and you're going to play Ant a bunch of minutes, like you need to play, you just need, you need more length off the bench. Like it's just kind of the reality of the roster. Next question comes from Blazers Rose 47 at Blazers Rose 47 on Twitter, who asks, it feels like we badly lost the Norman Powell for, oh, sorry, let me edit this in real time. It feels like we badly lost the Powell for Gary Trent Jr. swap. Similar players offensively, but Trent plays bigger and is averaging two and a half steals a game. Thoughts? I'm going to strongly disagree with this one. Um, I think Norman Powell is better at basically everything than Gary Trent Jr. I think the real argument for Gary Trent Jr. is that he's younger and could be better than Norman Powell. Like that's the argument. But then Powell's locked up for five years, which seems like a bad news, right? Because it's like a lot of Norman Powell. It doesn't seem like bad news, but it's just like a big commitment to Powell is probably the best way to say that. Um, I, I love, I'm a Norman Powell believer. Um, but Gary Trent is on a, a two plus one. He's on a two year deal with it with an, a player option. Like it, there, there's not a lot of value for the Raptors in that you'd rather have nor if you're a team, like from the team's perspective, you'd rather be locked in, I think to a five year deal than a two plus one, where if Gary Trent, um, the only way he opts into that final year is if he doesn't deserve the money. Like if he's worse than the contract, otherwise he's opting out and you're gonna have to pay him a bunch of money. Uh, like, um, the Blazers ended up in a better place. And I just think Norman Powell is, is just straight up better. I think he's a better offensive player because Gary Trent Jr. is really limited in what he does offensively. Like really, he can really shoot it. Um, and he's and he's a good pull-up shooter. But Norm can really shoot it and is a good pull-up shooter and gets to the rim and gets fouled and is really aggressive downhill and is a better transition player. Um, neither of them are passers, so you're not getting that bonus either way. Neither of them has a super tight handle, could run a team like... Um, and defensively, I just think Norm is a better defensive player. Gary Trent Jr. is really aggressive um, and is averaging two and a half steals a game in an, in a, in an aggressive scheme in, in Toronto. And I don't think he's bad, but I, I just think what he is is younger than Norm. I think that, I think that's the difference. I mean, your mileage may vary, quite frankly. Like, um, I one of the things I kind of dislike in the media game is just false expertise. I don't mean to be an expert. That's just my opinion. I think Norm's better. Um, but if you like, a, a, you know, it is totally, if you think I'm totally off base, I think you could, you could make a compelling argument that I'm wrong, but uh, <laughs> I wouldn't believe you. I, you're not going to convince me the way I might not convince you. So uh, to each their own, I, 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 I guess. The next question comes from Jacob G and Hawthorne, who says, Norman Powell is undersized for a small forward, but his point of attack defense against star wings is his point of attack defense against star wings really that bad. Many felt he played well against Michael Porter Jr. in the Denver series. Also, I was impressed with his defense on Paul George in the recent Clipper ga Clippers game, where it seemed like he harassed George and forced tough shot after tough shot. What am I missing? Yeah, I don't think Norm is like bad on defense. I, I think he's competitive. He's just, um, he's just not, he's not one of, he. Like, I think here's here's the way I would describe it. You never have a matchup with Norm guarding a, like one of those apex wings, to use a Hollinger phrase, um, like like a true star wing, like Paul George is, where you think that Norm has an advantage. Do you think Norm could hold his own? Sure, but it's never, he's just gonna like swallow him whole like Geppetto. Like he just, it's like, you know it, like there are nights when um, when you see one of these elite defenders, like, you know, Ludort, OG Ananobi. Um, Kawhi when he was healthy, where they just they just envelop someone on the perimeter, and that and that person has no chance. Norm is competitive; he gets up in your chest. He's he's physical and he's strong, but like he doesn't ever in those matchups, he doesn't ever have like a physical advantage, um, where you're say like, okay, well Norm will take care of him. You know, the answer is more like Norm can probably hang, and I think that's that's like that's where it is. Like Norm can probably hang. The I think that's kind of the level of defender he is. Um, the, the Blazers would be better with a with a. They would be like. There's a difference in being like a competent defender and like one of the really good ones. And the Blazers, like he's a competent defender. He's not one of the really good ones. Next question comes from Connor Gregg, who asks, "Who would win the NBA title if every team had to cut their starters and only play their bench group of seven or eight all year?" I like this question. This is typically a third segment question, but we'll just answer it here real quick. Um, 
I think it's the, the two teams that came to mind that I think will meet in the finals of, of all bench finals will be the Knicks with Derek Rose, Emmanuel Quickly, Alec Burks, Obi Toppin, and Nerlens Noel or Taj Gibson, whoever you want to bring off the bench. Um, and then they'll play the Clippers with Terrence Mann, Justice Winslow, Luke Kennard, Marcus Morris, or I, Isaiah Hart and Isaiah Hartenstein. And those times when Marcus Morris starts, you just say Mann, Winslow, Kennard, Nick Batum, and Isaiah Hartenstein. Uh, those are not like when you're getting to five man bench units, you know, you're, you're digging um, pretty far down there, but the teams with like elite elite star power are typically not in this place. And I think the, the Clippers, the Knicks starting a lot of kind of stinks right now, their bench helps them win all their games and the Clippers um, that man canard Hardenstein group, like trio has been awesome off the bench. And Marcus Morris is, is an elite shooter, although he's, he's had some health problems and Justice Winslow um, is at least intriguing enough that he should play. And um, if, if you're going all bench, uh, the other team that I think deserves mention, I would I would probably pick the Knicks over them is the Chicago Bulls. Kobe White, Alex Caruso, Troy Brown Jr., Derek Jones Jr., and Tony Bradley. Uh, Patrick Williams is hurt. Otherwise, he would start, and then you could move Javante Green in there. So Kobe, Kobe White, Alex Caruso, Troy Brown, Derek Jones, Tony Bradley, and then some kind of Javante Green, probably over uh, Troy Brown. Like that's that's a good group. Two Tar Heels too, so uh, you know you're you know you're gonna do all right. All right, let's come back in the third segment. Close out the show with more of your questions on this glorious Mailbag Monday. But first, let me tell you about Bet Online. It's back and better than ever with a new website and a new interface for the start of basketball season. It's your number one spot for basketball and football because they got more props, more odds, and more lines than they've ever had before. You can go there on your desktop. You can go there on your mobile device. And when you're there, use that promo code Locked On, and you'll receive a 50% welcome bonus when you are making your first deposit. From basketball to football to NHL to combat sports like boxing and UFC to soccer here and abroad and even your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait. Go and take advantage of this amazing offer, Bet Online. It's the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action. That's betonline.ag, where the game starts. Still a pass first point guard. Still Mike Richmond. We're still listening to Locked On Blazers. We're still cruising through a glorious, I've called it Mailbag Monday a couple times, but it's technically a special delivery mailbag coming to you uh, on a Wednesday here or uh, or if you live somewhere else or are listening at another time after Wednesday. But our next question, this glorious Mailbag Monday, is from Isaac who asks, Watching the Houston game, there were a few fast break points by Nazir Little, and it made me wonder, what is the Blazers' most athletic lineup? I came up with Anthony Simons, Norman Powell, Nazir Little, and Larry Nance. I wasn't able to think of a fifth man who was NBA quality. I'm not sure I'd want to include Greg Brown III or CJ Ellaby. What do you think is the Blazers' most athletic NBA-level five-man grouping? I think you got it right just throwing Dennis Smith Jr. Um, before the back stuff, before the back injuries, Dennis Smith Jr. was a freak, was like a crazy little dunker um, from Fayetteville, North Carolina, the pride of NC State. Or if you're one of my relatives who's a state fan listening, the guy, the guy who ruined NC State by taking some cash. Um, he he was he's still a, probably a darn good athlete, and I put him in here, and I think he's NBA level. Uh, Greg Brown is a freak athlete, and maybe if you're just, I think maybe you just. Uh, like shoehorn Greg in there just just because of the athleticism, but yeah, I think it's I think it's Dennis Smith. Um, he's he's a, he's a really athletic little guy. Like he was he was a highlight factory. Um, it's the reason why he was supposed to be a star in the league. Like he, when he was drafted, um, if you can go that far back in in your um, in your memory palace, like he was he was coming out of draft night the favorite to win Rookie of the Year. People thought he was going to be that like that good. Um, he, he wasn't. He was like second team all rookie. He was fine. Um, he was his best season. Was probably his rookie year. Um, he's he's an NBA player, but he's not. He didn't ever become the star, and some injuries kind of sapped of what he is. But yeah, I think your most athletic Blazers lineup is Dennis Smith and Norm Nas and Larry Nance. Next question comes from Joshua Arias. That's J W Arias twenty five on Twitter at J W Arias twenty five, who asks hypothetically speaking. If each Blazer had the opportunity to risk getting yelled at for wanting a bowl of cereal instead of watching film, which brand of cereal would each Blazer be taking the risk for? So um, <laughs> this story is um, an illusion, or this question is an allusion to a story written by Quick. Um, Quick's made a lot of appearances here. He might just be a really good reporter. Um, 
when Anthony Simons was like early on in his career, he he like he was going to work out at the Blazers practice facility after a bad game with um, with the trainer Phil Beckner, and and you know they get down to to go they start to go watch. They're gonna you know Phil gives them a big speech and they're ready to go watch film, and Ant kind of says like, hey, can we can we do it in the in like the dining room? I, I want to get some cereal first and Phil like lost it and cussed him out and like went nuts. And it was like, and it, and it's now kind of like a funny story. The two look back on of like how much Ant has changed and how his work ethic has changed and like how much he's matured and all these things. Um, but when Jason wrote the story, I, I, I didn't, he was on the podcast and he talked about it and I didn't say it here, but I, I told, I, I said this to his face or maybe I texted him, but we talked about it. I said, dude, no reveal on what, uh, on on what cereal ant wanted like are you losing your touch because um you know the great reveal like the the sort of like trick of reporting is those those fun little details that are the soul of narrative um but in the blazers facility it's like uh they got everything they got a whole, this got a whole lineup there's not like one cereal or ant special cereal it's like a it's like a buffet you know there's like a bunch of plastic boxes and you take your pick and fill it up like so guys can go get a bowl of cereal when they want one um instead of doing 15 serial types and like a long a long joke as i've used a lot of these to do kind of like my monologue i'll just say that like i think i think the best cereal is cinnamon toast crunch um not something i eat regularly but i really do think um as my friend chuck says ctc is is uh um is the best cereal so hopefully they would all go get a big bowl of cinnamon toast crunch before getting getting yelled at uh as a kid i really also like reese's puffs and i would accept that i also mess with kicks and as i'm older i don't really i'm not a big cereal guy but like shout out to chris Bex. i'll give i'll give chris Bex a shout out you could yell at me if i was eating a bowl of chris Bex. so i think the answer is cinnamon toast crunch <laughs> but um uh, you know, they got options. It's a good thing about having a good gig in the NBA. You got options, all types of cereal you can eat while getting yelled at by your trainer for not having a strong enough work ethic. Our next question is from an anonymous listener. This is a regular question asker who is who is an anonymous listener. Would um, I am excited to have an anonymous, anonymous and consistent question asker on the show. The anonymous question asker asks, or the anonymous listener asks, what's your favorite blazer bar in town? Uh, it's been a long time since I've gone to watch um, a Blazer game at a bar. Um, in large part because of this, I got I I can't really go and watch the games and then um, you know and drink a handful of beers and then record a daily podcast. Uh, also, I attend the home games in person, and then there was like a global pandemic that made going out to bars um, less than desirable for you know eighteen months. Uh, so. It's been a minute, but I but I think um, I, I think the qualities that make a good bar are sound. I um, there are some bars I really like, and I'm not going to name them here that are like that claim to be Blazer bars, and they're really good bars, but they're not good Blazer bars because they do not play the sound. If you're going to go watch the game at the bar, you do not want them to play, um, you know. <laughs> fun indie rock over the top of over the instead of um you know, lamar and, and kevin right like you want to hear the game if you're invested in the game you're going to want to hear the audio so audio is important good viewing is important um and uh and, and quality tvs is important like i used to go to holman's all the time on 28th because no one would go there because they had standard definition television like in 2013 uh loved holman's bless bless that that wonderful bar but like awful TVs and I could watch bad game. I could watch games with terrible reception because um, I didn't have cable and uh, and no one would be in there because the TV had terrible reception. Um, so I, I, I really do think, and I think this is somewhat of a cop out that, that Spirit of 77 is the best Blazers bar. Um, it's, it's by the arena. They got the sound, they got a huge TV. Um, there aren't really bad seats because they're gonna put it on the big screen. I think that's important. Um, my homie Paul used to work there, shout out to Paul. Uh, it's it can get a little the scene isn't great so if you want something low key i think nepo 42 up on 42nd um they got they do chicken wing specials during the games and uh if you get a seat there's not always great seats but if you do get a seat they got a great tv over the bar and they got sound uh i think i think those are two um two truly money ones um but but like 
secretly the best bar is your neighborhood bar that plays the game because you just want to watch it and if they got the game on with sound like you can go watch it and it's like close by and dependable that's that's like secretly the best blazers bar the last question of the show comes from Gian at Gian Luca GL on Twitter who asks I guess that's Gian Luca GL Gian Luca twice um on Twitter, who asks, "What do you think the team? Why do you think the team presents a massive difference in performance in games away from Portland?" It's kind of the big question, right? Six and one on at, at home, one and seven on the road. Um, they're just a straight up bad road team, and they're like good, good, like they're pretty good in the Moda Center. Uh, it's you know, I'll say this: it is not uncommon for teams, particularly teams that are kind of like in the lower half of the. Uh, playoff standings or out of the playoffs to have massive home road splits. It's normal for teams to be worse on the road. It's probably not normal for the Blazers to be, um, to go from like a competent defense to a horrific defense on the road. They keep pointing to effort. They say it's effort. They say it's effort and energy and focus. And I don't really buy that. Some nights it is, but a couple of the nights they've been in the game with eight minutes left and just lost. It's not energy and effort if you make it you know, 32 and a half minutes and then lose. It just means you didn't play well at crunch time. Um, those are different things. Like getting blown out because you didn't bring it in Denver is, is, just, is just not the same as not having it in the final few minutes, you know, in a 90 second stretch against the Clippers. Like those are just different. Those are different um ailments right um so it's not it's unknowable like i think the blazers will be much worse on the road than they are they're on the at home all year uh some of it is um it's just like kind of the nature of the sport is that teams you know your you team teams play better at home teams play worse on the road um I did read a story in um, in 538 that's saying home home court advantage is, is becoming a, a little less valuable. So maybe we're trending away away from that to some extent. But um, uh, the math there is maybe a little beyond my comprehension to explain it cleanly, Jean Luca. But um, it's uh, yeah, I, I think this is kind of the big question for this team. You know, I, I think this is the big question for this team. It's can they become something like a like an average team on the road uh the path to 50 wins is simple you go 30 and 11 at home it's 30 wins and you go 20 and 21 on the road a little less than 500 that's a 50 win team that's the path there the blazers are they got the they got the first part down in terms of win percentage really tough games this week with chicago and philly coming up uh depending on if joel and beads and availability but um it's this is it like can they be a road team is will be the question we ask all year it's the question it's we'll do i'll do a dang show about it before they go on the road next week like it's 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 gonna be a part of it like it's it's for sure gonna be um it'll be the burning question i do not have an answer for you uh this isn't a place for fake expertise i'll tell you right up i don't know blazers don't know either that's going to do it for our mailbag episode. If you want to get involved in a future mailbag, tweet at me at Mike G. Rich or send me an email, lockedonblazerspod at gmail.com. Do me a favor, go subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you made it this far into the episode, you enjoy the program. So go to YouTube right now, search Locked on Blazers and subscribe to the show. Don't wait. Don't do it later. Do it right now. Don't make, like, you're holding your phone in your hand if you listen to the podcast or you're, or you're driving. Put, Pull over, pull over your car and, and, and search for Locked On Blazers on YouTube and subscribe to the show. I'd, I'd truly appreciate it. Uh, also, just tell your friends about the show. They can find it wherever they get podcasts and as well as YouTube. Just search Locked On Blazers. We will be right there waiting for them. Uh, tomorrow night, Blazers play the Bulls. We'll have a recap after that game. Friday show, Jason Quick's going to be on um, going to be on the program. So don't miss either of those. Should be a lot of fun. Uh, Bulls going to be a tough test. And Jason always brings the goods. Um, and he'll have an update on whatever's happening with the team as well as the latest with the Neil Olshay saga. Um, so, yeah, five days a week. Make this show your first listen. It's a free podcast wherever you get podcasts and also on YouTube. Listen to the show. Tell your friends to do the same. Appreciate you listening. Talk to you soon.